There is one area of military service that has always been shrouded with secrecy and mystery, an area of service that has remained an enigma through tradition as well as necessity. They say it takes a very special kind of person to serve for months at a time underwater in confined spaces without sunlight. Stay with us as we talk with a panel of those very special people and dive into the world of Submariner. There is a world known only to a few, a world open only to the initiated. It's a dangerous, complex, and forbidding world. It is the world of submarines. Few ships are as intriguing or mysterious as the submarine. Seeing it this way is like catching a glimpse of a wild thing on the edge of its domain. Soon this ship will dive and disappear, and for months at a time, she will sail an unseen world. Thanks for tuning in tonight to Veterans Voices. I'm Nathan Johnson. Tonight's show will take you on a journey into that unseen world. We will be talking with submariners. If you want to be part of the conversation, call us at 925-313-313. 1170. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One or email us veteransvoices at contracostatv.org. I want to introduce you to our great panel. We've had them on for an hour. They are a great group and I'm very excited about tonight's show. Tonight's panel of submariners is Tim Carlisle, Alan Cole, John North, Bill Dominic, Dominic Boncourt, and Brian Woodson. Gents, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we've we've had to kind of calm the casual banter here a little bit because there's just a lot for the six of you to share in regards to your very personal experiences on submarines. But Dominic, I think we're going to start with you, sir, because we want to we want to start at the very beginning. What does it take for someone to be selected to serve on a submarine in the United States Navy? Well, submarines are volunteer service. You can volunteer, and that only gets your name on a list. It goes in. They evaluate you based on your service, whether you're coming out of boot camp or already in, or already in service. And you might, it comes back, accept it for submarine training. Well, then you have to go through submarine physicals, pressure testing, escapes from underwater, go to school, and then finally get a submarine, at which point you don't have to qualify, which you will operate every major piece of equipment on that boat. The testing is not yes, no, true, false, multiple choice. You will do what's required. It's also an evaluation, both subtle and overt, for the whole time you're in a submarine. It's, it's very, very tough because it only gives you a year to do this and qualify and earn your dolphins, at which point you are now a qualified submariner. So a very rigorous, very highly specialized force. And when you say qualify, is there some type of final exam? And if you pass and become qualified, what generally follows in terms of any type of uh, change of role or uh, promotion or any additional access that comes from a qualified submariner? So qualifying is everybody, the cook, the torpedo men, quartermasters, that everybody has to qualify, period. Then you have a specialty. I was a quartermaster. I, mean, I was a navigator's assistant. Uh, John was a cook. Uh, that is, becomes your specialty. Qualifying is one thing. Then you have your specialty job. I see. And so you're supposed to be very good at that. So, gents, let's open it up to the rest of the panel. A little bit about your experiences of why you chose, and, and, and I, th I believe it's Submariner, but I've heard different versions of that. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but what would make someone, what would make you 
uh, our panel tonight, want to choose such an elite, uh, very difficult, strenuous, uh, challenging, and very small part of the Navy? Can I start out? Yeah, go, please. Okay. Um, when, when I was in high school, uh, Vietnam was in full bore, and I was really getting tired of school. I didn't want to go to college. And I decided that rather than to be drafted, I wanted to go ahead and join the Navy, made my own call. And through basic training, um, up in the beginning of the class on one of the training sessions that we had, the, the instructor said, who would like to volunteer for submarine service? And I raised my hand and I thought, well, yeah, I think I can do that. And uh, quite personally, I think it was probably the best thing that I ever did for myself, um, bar none. Yeah, you know, I mean, I joined in a different era, which was I you know, joined the Navy in 1980, and I didn't want to go to college either, and I didn't initially start out to be a submariner, but what happened is I was, I was going through school, and I started looking at what my options were at the end of school. I'd made pretty decent grades, and the submariner's schooling was far better, plus there was the added, hey, this is some pretty interesting types of work that you do. And it was still working on computers, which is what I did then, what I do now, but that's what got me interested. For me, I think um, my parents, they were rewiring their home and uh, the electrician was, uh, uh, he was an EM and he gave me all the stories about submarine life and I was so hooked. I used to watch the old World War II movies, uh, Voice to the Bottom of the Sea, bring that up. But uh, <laughs> when I decided that I wanted to uh, join the Navy, I decided I only wanted submarines and nothing else. And that was in my contract. I had to be on submarines. So uh, it was a very nice career. So Brian, you, you, you used a uh, acronym there that I think our audience is not familiar with, EM. What is an EM? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they call them electrician's mate okay. on a submarine. Gotcha. So, so different reasons to join and different reasons to be inspired. You, you find yourself joining the Navy. You find yourself attached to a submarine. You're out here on your very first deployment. The, the boat dives under the water. What are your first thoughts? You're not going to see land. You're not going to see the sun. Uh, you're not going to see your family maybe for several months. Um, were there any immediate regrets? I'd like to share a thought that I had in the no. beginning. Um, I was on a, a commissioning crew of a brand new nuclear submarine, and uh, we made our first dive on sea trials. And I was a, a mess cook. I was doing washing dishes and silver and all that stuff. And I was in the mess hall, and I looked over at a radio man, a chief radio man that had the headsets on. And uh, in each compartment, they have. Um, uh, uh, a moderator that has the headsets on that uh, is in, in contact with the control room during the dive. And I looked over at this chief radio and I'm only 18 years old and he was probably in his thirties and um, he was sweating bullets. He was so scared because that boat had never been underwater before. And I was thinking to myself, this is great. This is like an e-ticket ride. I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same way it is when you come out of overhaul when you're in overhaul, you yep. see great big patches cut out of the hull, and then they put them back in and they weld them back up. And now you go out into the water and see if the whole the welds hold. They do. Mm -hmm. We haven't Another, lost it, we haven't it, lost but one one nuclear submarine on them, sea trials, and that was the, the thresher. Right. Yeah. But that was different type of uh, problem. They had a seawater leak. But. Uh, well, Bill mentioned uh, sea trials. Uh, along that line is uh, taking a boat to test that, which becomes quite interesting. And uh, just the noises the boat makes and the big bangs and rhythms and vibration and all the things that you just didn't expect that sort of just makes you snap your head. Say, what was that? It's an awakening. <clears throat> And we look at things like when I went out for the first time, they ran a string across the passageway yeah. and they put a, a nut on in the middle of the string. And then as the boat went down deeper, the hull would compress and you see how far down that 
nut would sink, would go down on that stream between oh, yeah. the two poles. <laughs> and this is something that runs off of nuclear bit. power, correct? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I had people, I was watching, they were watching Das mm -hmm. boat and he takes it to test step and they had the noise when he gets to his test step. And then somebody asked me, Don, do you ever take a boat to test step? I said, yeah. He says, what is, does that noise sound real? I says, it doesn't do justice to the actual thing. No, it doesn't. <laughs> That's no, true. Not, look, if you've been a test step, you'll know what you guys, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Well, these are some of the, the, the war stories, right? Uh, sharing a hot racking, I think, is some of the things we hear about. <laughs> Having to be absolutely quiet. Not seeing sunlight for maybe months at a time. But give us some examples of a day in the life of a submariner. It, it, what, what is the day, where's the day start? Where's the day end? I know everyone has their individual specialties, as Dominic mentioned. But... Well, you, you well, how do you get this? How do you get this? Sta watch stations that you stand watch on, and they're usually cut up into four or six hours uh, at a time. And you go man your watch station, then you're off for six or twelve hours. And in the meantime, you can go down to the galley, and they usually show movies or play cards or things like that. And I now, remember one time we were out at Christmas, and just to make people a little bit more at ease at Christmas time. I took a piece of wire and I made a Christmas tree out of it. We had green garbage bags. They were green plastic bags and I would shred the green up and hung it on the wire to make it look like a green Christmas tree. And then we had little bunk lights and I would make a star out of the bunk lights. To add what, what Bill's talking about uh, with regard to the, the day in the life of the boat, um, actually, uh, during all of our times in service, uh, not so now because they, they operate on a 24-hour day schedule, but during our service time, we were on an 18-hour day. Um, we were on three watch sections, six hours each, and we would rotate through each one of those watch sections. Uh, not the cook and the mess cooks. We were on a, a, a different schedule completely because we had to serve meals every six hours for the ongoing and offgoing watch sections. But um, to, to think about that for a second, when you when you dive the boat and you remove yourself from the, the daylight and the world above you, you're, uh, you're on an 18 hour day. So you don't know whether it's morning, noon, evening, midnight, whatever. The only thing you can tell is by what you smell. You smell food. You smell the fresh baked bean, fresh excuse me, fresh bread being baked. Um, little nuances like that. But I, I guess uh, the, the interesting concept is to accustom yourself to be comfortable with an 18-hour day as opposed to a 24-hour day. And it, uh, it it is interesting because it impacts your your sleeping patterns. Um, everything in your life is changed because of that. So someone else jump in there now. Well, some of us have been on uh, six on and six off. Uh, we used to call that port and report. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, I did that. It's still a six hour watch. It's, it's still a six hour. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I like to say that um, the highlight, besides the movies and all that, is in the morning. You knew when you had those those fresh. Um, uh, cinnamon buns that they used to she make buns. in the morning. Uh, you knew that that was going to be the morning. That's your breakfast in the morning. And, uh, and you know, you get used to, when we used to come up to Periscope Depth, we used to come out at night. So you knew if we were going up, it must be dark out. So uh, we're on a 24-hour clock, so it's, it's a little bit different uh, when you have to come up to Periscope Depth. Uh, it takes a while to get up there, and you got to look and make sure you have no contacts around, and then you pop up. And then you're on the surface, and depending upon the sea state, that can change your entire day. And a lot of the senior people know what I'm talking about when we go to sea state, <laughs> and that boat is just rocking back and forth on the surface. So Al, Al can chime in on that because he's been out there a lot. Another thing you can do is at nighttime, the control room used to rig for red. They had red sleeves over some of the fluorescent lights. 
And those were the only lights on so that everybody's eyes are accustomed to the dark. And then you can look out of the periscope and you don't get night blindness. Uh, hey, so, Al, what do you think? Well, I, <laughs> I agree with everything, but, um, you know, the, uh, I like the, the little note about the rig for red because there was times that we rigged for black. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell a story about that later, but it doesn't kind of fit in with this group. But, but well, uh, let me ask anyway, a question of you, Al. Yeah, you can tell in many ways, you can tell what time of day it is by you walk into the mess decks and what kind of meal they're serving. Right. At least that tells you what for you what time of day it is, you know. Uh, and sometimes you speed the, the clock ahead when you leave port so that you're in the same time zone as where you're headed. You know? So yeah. there's a lot of time changes out there. Al, let me ask you real quickly, though. A lot of mentioning about not knowing what time it was, but you knew what kind of food. Let me ask you, did you often know where you were going? Or do you often know where you were or what you were doing out there? Well, yeah, on, on a couple of the boats I served on, we actually had a chart on the mess decks. And the quartermaster would come down, stick little pins in it. and But it had to be kind of a, a vague <laughs> GPS. Let me use that expression because... Technically and, and security-wise, we weren't supposed to know where we were going. But if you didn't know where we were going, just by the the uh, the compass heading, then you were some kind of a blithering idiot. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, now there was a question in the chat about us uh, getting messages. We could receive messages, but we could not send them. <laughs> So we could receive them passively. In other words, uh, we didn't have to transmit to get them because a lot of times we would just be somewhere and they'd have a device that we, you know, just collect the message to the call a floating wire and it, we'd be able to receive messages about our, from our, we called them family grams. They're like 30 or 40 words and some of the poor guys like uh, Brian used to have to get them all and read them and make sure they were okay and so forth and so on. As a quartermaster, being that Al mentioned it, uh, I'm, a, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a navigator's assistant, let's put it that way. So uh, ideas of where you were going would depend on uh, what charts we ordered and uh, what tracks we were laying out. And at least I had a a sense before the rest of the crew would find out anything about where we were going or what was supposed to happen. I think on the, on the newer boats, you know, we had, I was a nav, I, I worked in navigation system. So, you know, we always knew where we were at at any given time, but um, you know, there are points, you know, it's a lot of times that we had to go to um, a controlled situation where um, a lot of people just didn't have a need to know. So as we went through the evolution, it might be 30 days. It might be longer than that, that until we get to certain areas that we didn't allow the crew to know where we were at. Wow. So that's just the operational security. Yeah, very, very important. Well, we are gonna stop this conversation temporarily, but when we come back, we're gonna dive even deeper into the life of a submariner. First, we want to take a moment to honor the service of Master Sergeant Tommy L. Macias in this month's Shadowbox segment hosted by the newest member of our Veterans Voices team, Crystal Kane. Hi, Master Sergeant Tommy L. Macias attended basic training in May 2001 at Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego, followed by Marine Combat Training at Camp Pendleton. In January of 2003, he was deployed to Southwest Asia to support Operation Iraqi Freedom. In 2008, he was promoted to sergeant at 29 Palms. Can you shut that door? His long and distinguished Marine career took him to Okinawa, Afghanistan, Korea, the Philippines, Thailand, and Australia. He was promoted to his current rank of Master Sergeant on April 1st, 2020. And after 21 years of honorable and faithful service, Master Sergeant Macias retired from the Marine Corps. We honor his service. 
We're talking tonight with submariners. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're enjoying this conversation. This is a very unique bunch of veterans. Do you want to be a part of the conversation? We'd love to have you. Maybe you served on a submarine, or maybe you have questions or comments for those crazy enough to have spent their military career on a submarine. Call us now at 925-313-1170. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One, or email us Veterans Voices at ContraCostaTV.org. Gentlemen, we're back, and we have another question. Um, it actually came in from one of our audience members by phone before the show started. And I think this is going to take us into the, the territory of some of the dangers and some of the effects of serving on a submarine. And I want to start talking about how it affects a person um, long term or even short term. But the question from our audience is tell us about your worst reactor scram. And I don't know what that means, but I have a feeling that maybe some of you do. <laughs> well, a reactor scram is when the nuclear power plant has a problem and the reactor shuts itself down. That way it doesn't uh, create any problems and then you have to recover from whatever problem started the scram and bring the nuclear power plant back up. Usually it was a electrical problem or a seawater problem. But you just have to deal with whatever the problem was first and then bring the reactor plant back up online. And you, also, you always had batteries that produced uh, backup power so that you had some power in the submarine at all times. But the poles and the holes, that's what I recall. And you also yeah. have a diesel engine that you can run if you're and snorkel on the, you know, with the, the snorkel mast up, which is, you know, we could be at periscope depth and then run the diesel and that'll provide us a bunch of power as well, or some power. So and I don't know if anyone has a war story along this realm, but I guess our audience would like to know about your worst reactor scan. Now that we have an understanding of what this is, it doesn't sound like it's a good day. Sounds like it's no, a it's really not. bad day. And that when you have a scram like that uh, and you have to come up uh, and you hear announcements that uh, we've experienced a full reactor scram, uh, sometimes it's a fast recovery and sometimes they have to what we call a cold start. And if we're on a cold start, you're sitting up on the surface, not on the surface, but at periscope depth using a secondary propulsion system. You're sitting there, it could be six hours before they bring it back online. And so we've, uh, I've experienced that sitting in radio uh, and uh, bobbling along, making slow progress. And you might not be in your neighborhood. You might be in somebody else's. I see. Which could make it a little more crazy. I see. Gotcha. Okay. So there, there might be some sensitivity here to sharing some of your worst stories because of where you might have been in that circumstance. Uh, we had a scram that was really bad at one time and it caused other problems and we couldn't talk about it to anybody, even people that came down to visit the ship. And that was just what the captain wanted and that was okay. But yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes you can be there for hours and things aren't going well. And then, you know, you have to figure out how you're going to do things or things break. You know, people think, oh, ships, submarines, other submarines. Heck, just fighting the sea is bad enough because things break. You know, valves give way. We have a backup for everything. But, you know, you get pretty serious flooding. It can get pretty scary pretty quick. This all thanks to us being qualified in submarines. Yeah. Another thing you have to say is there is no radio shock out at sea. You are the radio shock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all have to work together. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about then some of the effects of being underwater, not seeing sunshine for several days, having this level of risk, not only things that could go wrong with the submarine, but uh, encounters with other countries or areas. Um, after serving on a submarine for one deployment or for one enlistment or for one entire career, which some of you have done, how have you noticed that this experience changed or impacted who you are as a person physically or even psychologically? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I could just jump in real quick. Like I, I just give you a little quick note on when we came in off of our first patrol, we pulled into Yakuska, Japan, and uh, myself being uh, in charge of the galley, um, I was probably one of the first ones topside up the ladder to make sure that we had fresh produce and ice cream and stuff like that on the pier. And I can remember profoundly after a 90 day patrol that um, when I put my head up through that hatch and the sun hit the cheek of my face for the first time in three months, that, uh, well, that's something I'm never gonna forget. It, it, it was profound. And uh, you know, it just makes you uh, appreciate the simple things a little bit more than we all take for granted. Uh, just sim the simple thing is the sun shining on your face. You know? But think about that after three months. Uh, one of the initial things that happened to a lot of the people when we pulled into port was we were, we were in a, a, a very sterile environment for the, the three months. And uh, what would happen, and the corpsman would say this profoundly too, that a lot of the guys would catch colds or yes. get the flu or get sick in some minor form or another because there were no bugs on board our boats. Not until we hit the surface did we get the bugs. Yeah, the pandemic's kind of like been one long deployment, at least that's yeah. part of my yeah. perspective, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> Work from home, but you can go out and see the sun. What's not to like? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. I think the other thing is the routine that we go through um, after you get so used to it and you, you kind of like, I want that routine. And even in my adult life right now, I still miss that routine sometimes. Um, you know, you've been submerged, you come back up and you, you want to work, you want to keep going through the motions like that. And as a young sailor, you know, I didn't realize that it was going to affect me in my adult life, but I'm, I, I'm used to a structured life. And that's what you know, you, you, you learn that on submarines, a structured life and a lot of discipline. Hmm. My wife says that I'm anal. <laughs> 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 I, I ran the galley, okay? So, so uh, you know, everything has to have its place. It has to be put away when you're done using it. And and, and so that's it. That's very basic to me. And Wh Why is that basic to you, though, John? Help us understand that. Help us understand no, no, no. why being anal and organized is important on a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, my, after I got into the Navy, I was looking for a job and I was told to go to this company for a job and I went, it was a naval architect, marine engineering company, and I went in the ambiance motor, uh, you know, pictures and models and whatnot. I sat down and uh, looked at the pictures and there's a picture of a submarine. And I looked and I said, oh, Threadfin, 410 boat. And the gentleman says, what'd you say? I said, Threadfin, 410 boat. He says, you know submarines? I said, uh, I'm a submariner. He says, you're hired. <laughs> now, what? <laughs> this, is, this is God's honest truth. <clears throat> he says, well, we got this job. We're looking for a submarine, in effect, uh, helping Portsmouth Naval Shipyard convert guppy sub, uh, fleet boats to guppies. I wound up working for the company 45 years. I still work for the grandson part-time, only because I was a submariner at the right place at the right time. <laughs> yep. That's good. That's good. So uh, what I'm hearing is it's it's built uh, a significant identity. Uh, you yes. you oh, identify yeah. as submariners, even though you've been out of the Navy service maybe for quite a few decades. Uh, since 54. Yeah, you know, when we think... 40 plus 22 is uh, 68 years, yeah. yeah. You know, when you figure it out, it's crazy. But we do things in a certain way, but it works in that world. I mean, it's like John being a cook. He has everything put back up because we do this thing called angles and dangles where we go fast and oh, buy yeah. and deep and come up. And if something's not put up, it comes loose. And sometimes things break loose, which can be more exciting. Mm -hmm. It's a mess. It can be a yeah. mess. I remember one time we were cleaning switchboards during the downtime. We got it all cleaned up. We put the blockers back between the switchboards. And we went out for a sea trial. 
And the old man says, okay, angles and dangles. And so we started going up and down and sideways and so forth. And that locker wasn't bolted down. The guy that was supposed to bolt it down forgot. And the locker came out from between the switchboards and parts went all over the, the deck. And the, and the old man says, okay, store the ship for sea now. Because everything's got to be secured and in its place. Or when you get out to rough seas, that stuff goes everywhere. I've watched, I literally watched a, a safe in radio unbolt itself from the bulkhead and just miss the radio man's head with a pair of scissors that was wedged in between, just miss his face as the safe was falling off onto the, uh, onto the deck. Now, for those not familiar with what angles and dangles are, it's uh, those of you that are watching, it's, uh, it's like flying an airplane underwater and not being able to see where you're going. It's, it can be 30 degrees up, 30 degrees starboard or port at the same time, or down port to starboard at the same time, any combination of those. And it, it's, it's a, a real thrill if you're rigged for it and if you're prepared for it, and uh, it will let you know if you're not. <laughs> I want to bring up something, too. It's a mannerism that every single one of us has and won't admit it. But I think about it a lot. I even use it as a joke. We learned on submarines, and it was not taught to us, but as you walk through the boat, you develop a habit of walking sideways. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, you put your back up to the bulkhead or the wall for civilians, you know, and to make room for your shipmate who's coming in the opposite direction. Sometimes I have fun with my wife. I walk around the house with my back up against the wall. And she asked me, what in God's name are you doing? I said, I'm just pretending I'm living on the submarine again. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, sorry, yeah. the greatest stories, you know, one of the routines that I really enjoyed was um, I uh, used to also be a helmsman. And uh, when oh, we yeah. used to uh, blow main ballast tanks uh, for an emergency oh. blow, that you is, the, ride. that was, that was the best ride uh, being you strapped in ride. and having yeah. the boat come crashing out of the water. That was just, uh, <laughs> that was a thrill. That was a well, thrill. A lot, of the you, younger, a, lot of the, a lot of the younger people don't know what an e-ticket ride is, but in Disneyland terms, that the, that's one of the best, the hottest, and the coolest rides you can get on. And riding a boat to the surface and popping up like a cork is a thrill you will not ever be able to experience unless you're on a submarine. And a lot of times, because I was a diving officer, as was Al, you know, we'll slow the boat down. We're doing it for test. But when it's for real and they take the, the two uh, handles, they call them chicken switches, and do one of these numbers and they blow it all. I mean, you're headed up like a rocket, and so, that can get a little crazy. Just so, for, so for a lot just of saying. people, a lot of civilians that don't understand, we have main ballast tanks, and we have emergency uh, tanks that uh, blow the uh, water uh, oh. out the main ballast tanks. And when he says those chicken switches, there's a bunch of switches that you lift up, and that dumps 4,500 pounds of pressure into those tanks, causing the submarine to get buoyancy, and it begins to go up and with a combination of the propulsion, you go to the surface, it's just like a, a cork or if you're in the bathtub and you yep. bring a, a, a cork under, under the water, it pops out of the water. But being able to drive that submarine to the surface, it's, it's amazing. Wow. You know, there's that a reminds, lot of... Go ahead. That reminds me of a story when we were out at sea, the engineering officer of the watch was taking a tour of lower level engine room and he looked up at the chaff seal. There's a a shaft that goes out through the boat, turn a propeller, mm -hmm. and then there was, the seal was leaking a little bit. So he came up to maneuvering, and he calls up to the control room, and he says, control maneuvering. He says, we have minor flooding in the engine room. We <laughs> pop to the surface like nobody's business. <laughs> and it shook him up, and he said, con maneuvering. He says, why did you emergency blow? And the captain happened to be in the engine, in the control room, and he says, you said we had flooding. He says, we only had minor flooding. The 
He says, you said flooding. Wow. That's well, one word you never use on submarine. Uh, These conversations yeah. Unless you actually are have flooding. very, very rich. I can tell there's the story. Word you, there's another word you never use on a submarine. That's fire. Fire. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because fire those and are flooding. the two most dangerous situations on a submarine, fire and flooding. Well, speaking of fire, I'm going to be fired from my job as host if I don't end this session and uh, go to a quick break. And we've got more time to talk about the life of a submariner. And we've got some questions from our audience. So when we return, we will conclude our conversation with our panel of submariners and answer all of your questions. We'll be right back. <laughs> Good show, guys. All right, we're having a great conversation with submariners tonight, and we invite you to contact us now with your questions, your comments. We've heard from a few of you, but you can call in now, 925-313-1170. Send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One, or email us, veteransvoices at contracostatv.org. So we've got our panelists, our, our panel of submariners tonight, sharing lots of great stories. We've got our audience participating as well. In fact, we have a message from one of, our, one of our audience members. Do you remember a time when you were being tracked by a vessel from another country? Yes. <laughs> well, usually the way it really works is we do the tracking. Sometimes that yeah. doesn't happen. Uh, we were on NATO ops, and usually because we're pretty, most of our submarines have always been pretty quiet, we would have to put something on to make us a little more noisy so they could find us. And uh, we were doing NATO ops in the Mediterranean, and our captain, who he, he was uh, brave, told our, uh, one of our nuclear train guys as many green flares as you can put on the flight deck of that, in, of that carrier in two minutes. And so they didn't know we were there, and we popped up. Well, we just basically shot the flares, and they landed on the flight deck and made the admiral up there all angry, and we thought it was fun. But it's difficult to be... I mean, we usually are the ones that could potentially do the tracking. Sometimes uh, you it may happen, or sometimes we're working with friendly nations, too. And when that happens, we may do war games with them or whatever you want to call it. That'd be my answer to that question. Mm. Sounds like a little blue on blue kind of training. Um, another question here, we can, we can say more about that if any other of you have uh, perspectives, but I want to get our other question into here too. Has anyone ever underway replenished a submarine while on patrol? So I think, I think the question is, you know, if a submarine needs supplies, is it possible to do so underway while the, while the submarine is out on patrol? There was, yeah. there was one, in, uh, they, weren't they testing uh, just recently? They landed some, they parachuted some supplies to a submarine uh, just recently using uh, one of the helicopters? Well, actually, yeah. it, they transferred the crew on one of our boomers uh, from Blue Crew to Gold Crew um, while at sea, which is usually... Uh, <laughs> not done usually you, you pull into port and you, you switch crews and, and that's that but uh you know they'll also do small boat transfers and maybe bring out mail and some supplies if we're in some place where we can do that and then there's sometimes in some runs where you don't have that issue no we, we you're, have you're to just suck it up on, on one of our patrols um on our longest run, I actually ran out of active dry yeast. And that may sound real simple to some of you guys, 
but uh, I couldn't make any homemade bread. I couldn't make dinner rolls for both of the noon and evening meals. So, or sticky buns. So, you know, the, the little simple things like that make a big deal, but uh, we weren't expected to go over our 90 day run. So um, it is what it is. We made do, we made soda breads and, and uh, here we are. <laughs> Um, I've walked on two layers of number 10 cans throughout the entire ship, including the CO stateroom. And as the food got eaten up, we didn't walk on cans anymore. So, hey. What, what was a number 10 can? What are you talking about, Tim? A number 10 can would be like one of these big cans of tomatoes. It's probably about this big around and about a, a this long. Size can. Yeah. A can. Yeah. Gotcha. And, Yeah. So what is the United States Submarine Veterans Organization? I noticed that some of you are wearing these vests, but I think all of you are probably members of an organization. Other than getting together and drinking, co drinking bad coffee and telling war stories, what is this organization? And what does this organization do to serve the community, serve veterans, and serve submariners? I'll take that one. You know, really what our purpose is, is our, we have a purpose and a creed and our, our, our purpose and creed is really to perpetuate the memory of our shipmates who gave their lives and pursued their duties while serving their country, that their deeds, dedication, supreme sacrifice, a constant source of motivation towards greater accomplishments. And we pledge loyalty and patriotism to the U.S. of the United States of America and its constitution. It's also a way where we get together because we all do very different things in life, but it's a way for us to get together for our mutual enjoyment. And then we also do have different things that we do in the community. Uh, there are several programs that uh, we have it, at the national level that is capped for kids. We go into hospitals and work with children that have it, you know, have significant health issues like cancer and things of that nature. We have some gifts. We, we also do things with Eagle Scouts. And matter of fact, I'm doing one here in a couple of weeks where I will go to their event and talk about how being an Eagle Scout, which is something that takes a lot of effort and work, is very similar to what we do in submarines when we qualify. We also have a charitable foundation in our national organization that helps out submarine veterans and their families whenever there's a, a distress like a hurricane or something like that where a family is losing everything. The Charitable wildfires. Foundation can help them. Wild, wildfires, any, any natural disasters. So it sounds like this is a, an organization that provides a lot of service to the community. It allows submariners to continue uh, to be of service to others. But all of you are members of this. What would you say to um, another fellow submariner who maybe hasn't joined an organization like this? What would be some of the important reasons why they would want to show up to the meetings, uh, be a part of the efforts to serve the community? Uh. Since I'm the youngest one, probably the youngest, newest, <laughs> the newest, I should be the newest. Um, for a long time, uh, being on the submarine that I was on, I couldn't talk about a lot of things. And a lot of the, uh, my friends couldn't understand. And uh, I just happened to meet Al Cole at uh, Travis uh, uh, base um, over at the um, commissary. And he had on his uh, Sea Wolf hat. And he actually invited me to the meeting and Seawolf was uh, one of my sister submarines. And uh, as I went to the meeting and I met uh, Tim here who was also on the same submarine as I was on and I could talk to him. And so having that camaraderie and that sense of, there's another Samaritan that went through, walked through that door and, and it, 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 it was a feeling of being at home that's, 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 it's a feeling of being at home. Yeah, you know, Al and I were on the same submarine. We weren't there at the same time, which is too darn bad. They really, really get along with it well. But yeah, it's that common sense of understanding that really matters to all of us, I think. Shared experiences are not underrated. I mean, we have all dealt with some difficult situations in 
in the Navy and on submarines where things broke or we were really struggling. I I had some guy ask me at a job interview one time about the hardest problem I ever fixed. I worked for a week with almost no sleep. I was the only guy trained on that piece of equipment, and I got it working eventually. First, it was my chief bringing me coffee, then it was my lieutenant bringing me coffee, and then it was the captain in the XO. And, uh, you know, I got it fixed, and I was ordered to go to sleep for like three days, and I did. <laughs> One of the other things we have is a national convention once a year. Uh, and then, you know, we just get big, big crowds. But one of the biggest part, uh, part of the convention is uh, boat reunions. They'll have a list of boats. If you served on this boat, we're having this reunion. And you sign up and know they've got whatever agenda they want. And you start to meet, you know, like Al or you, you meet people that you didn't serve with, but there's a commonality, like, you know, I always kid Joe Infiger. He mentioned his chief of the boat, and I said, Ken? He says, yeah, you know him? I says, yeah, he was a first-class torpedo man when I, you know, and it was like his cop and I served probably six years or whatever the hell it was before he got this. So you wind up, the boat becomes your identity. Mm. You were on that boat. All the guys, hey, yeah. and then you start talking about the various guys and right. how everybody is, right. and that's a great. Uh, I know I've gone to a bunch of them where I've really had uh, eight guys of the original crew. That's a you know one time. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, uh, one last question here a, for everyone from our audience. A lot of people think that you are a very special kind of people to do what you did. Do you feel there is something different about the breed of submariners? If so, what is it? You said it, breed. We're a different breed of cat. That's the way I explain it when I'm a docent on a Pompanito. People ask, you know, why did you do it? And I just say we're a different breed of cat. The Marines are a good outfit. What they do, they do well, but just a different breed of cat. We, you know, I just say we're a different breed of cat. You're right. But, you know, the same thing as we're people that have been tested over and over and over whether you're a brand new person just working on your qualifications, that's when, when you get your silver dolphins, that's when you start learning. And, you know, I mean, when you qualify diving officer, or which is the highest enlisted watch station, I mean, you've done some. You've probably qualified seven or eight or ten watches to get there and for them to entrust you. you your job is to do nothing other than reach and maintain whatever ordered depth happens to be. Whether you're in calm seas or 30 foot seas, keeping it plus or minus two feet. Think about that for as a physics problem. Well, I want to answer this question a, a little system? bit. Um, one thing that's unique about the breed of submariners <laughs> is their sense of humor. Because years ago when Tim worked for Contra Costa County, he saw a shelf in my office with different hats on it. And he brought this hat in here, knowing that I'm a Marine, knowing that I served in the Marine Corps. He brought me this hat knowing that if he gave it to me, I'd have to keep it on that same shelf and look at it every day. And so here, many years later, I'm wearing this hat in honor of those that served in submarines, those that gave their lives on submarines, um, I think I read the book, A Blind Man's Bluff, and the service that submariners uh, have is incredible. The, the mission of gathering intelligence and really keeping our country defended from the dark shadows underneath the ocean. So in tonight's sense, I will say the best submarine, the best marine is a submarine. So this concludes our panel discussion. A little later, we will have a list of resources for veteran submariners and those who want to learn more about that world. Now it's time to hear a veteran's voice. This month, Stephen Burchick talks with Navy veteran Jim Murphy. Enjoy. My name is Stephen Burchick, and our segment today is A Veteran's Voice. Our guest today is Jim Murphy. Jim, welcome. Thank you, Stephen. Glad to be here. Happy to have you. Can you tell us a little bit about your military experience? Uh, I served in the U.S. Navy uh, four years, right to the date. 
uh, served between 1968 and 1972. Um, I joined the service uh, uh, out of the result of being uh, A1 in the draft. I wanted to have control my own choices. The Navy seemed like a good operation to be a part of. And um, when I recruited with the recruiter, uh, I had a, a little bit of a background in art, some art school training. And one of the things that enticed me about the Navy is that they had a rating called Illustrator Draftsman that I was very interested in. And the recruiter promised me that that would be an excellent choice for me. So after taking a series of battery tests and qualifying, uh, I signed the papers and uh, went into the Navy and spent four years there. Okay. and. Uh... You said there was a, a little bit of irony as you were exiting the Navy? Yeah, I, uh, I, I got in the Navy and uh, what I found out was that uh, I wanted to be an illustrator draftsman only to find out once I was in boot camp that that uh, particular rating uh, was closed. And, and so they felt that I was a good candidate to become uh, an electrician in the Navy. I didn't know anything about electricity, although my father was an electrician by uh, trade, and so uh, I struck for electrician and became an electrician's mate in the Navy. Uh, upon my release of the Navy and my exit uh, interview uh, from the service for separation, the officer who interviewed me told me that it was good I was getting out of the Navy because I had no future as an electrician because my mechanical aptitude score was so low. And then he asked me point blank, uh, how come you never struck for illustrator draftsman? Now this is four years later. And I told him my story and he said, yeah, well, they, they, you should have been an illustrator draftsman. And he said, good luck in civilian life. And that's where I left. After leaving the military, can you describe your education and professional training? Uh, when I left the service, I uh, was able to go to college uh, utilizing the GI Bill and uh, I knew I wanted to pursue a career in the arts. And so I uh, ended up going to college and uh, received my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree uh, with an emphasis on graphic design and illustration. We understand that you had a rather lengthy career in the wine industry. Can you describe uh, how that worked out? I had a 40 year career uh, in the creative uh, marketing uh, industry. Uh, a good deal of it, about 14 years of it, was spent in the wine business, uh, mainly on the package development side and package design. Uh, worked for Fetzer Vineyards, uh, worked for Robert Mondavi Vineyards. I was their director of new package development and was a creative director in their group. Uh, kind of uh, enjoyed the wine business, got a great education, compliments of the winery on how to appreciate and enjoy wine and still do that to this day. I understand you also spent some time in the confectionery industry. I did. Uh, after about 14 years in the wine business, uh, I decided that uh, it was time to move on and I was looking for another winery group to possibly tie into and uh, the opportunity came up to work in the confections industry. and. Uh, I landed a job with Jelly Belly Candy Company out of Fairfield, and uh, they hired me on as their director of creative services worldwide. Uh, it was very rewarding. Uh, my, my particular department was responsible for all the packaging development and design, uh, all their media. Would you describe your transition into the fine arts area? After spending a career, I knew I'd always painted on the uh, during my career, and always wherever I traveled, I always had a sketchbook. I always sketched. Uh, I couldn't give it 100% of time because of my career, um, but I had made plans that once I was willing to move on from my career, I knew I wanted to have a secondary career as a fine art person. Uh, we have a couple of your images here of some of the work you've done. Can you describe? Uh, a little bit about these three pieces. Sure, I, I usually, uh, for my painting medium, I usually work with acrylic paints. As I mentioned, I like to work large. Uh, the series is a, is a large series of paintings that are on five by five foot uh, birch wood panels. 
Uh, one painting I did is called Pono. It's based on Italian, I mean, uh, Hawaiian um, uh, language, Polynesian language. Uh, the reason it's called Pono is in Hawaiian when people say, how are you doing when they meet on the street or whatever, they say everything's Pono, meaning life's good, life's wonderful. The imagery, all the wording on there has to do with good things in life, family, uh, very upbeat. Uh, another painting as part of that series is based on billiards. I call that one snookered. It's large billiard balls. Uh, the typography on that one and the letter forms are all based on uh, lingo as, a, as it relates to the, to the billiard industry. Another painting in that series is based on humor. I call that one Humor Me. It is a chair with just a simple whoopee cushion on it. Uh, and all of the, uh, the terminology on that one is all based on fun things, jokes, funny sayings. Finally, uh, any advice that you would have for veterans either looking to start a career or make a change in their career path? What would you uh, suggest? Well, you know, we're lucky today, uh, most of the military, they, they have training. Uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of the folks will get that training started in the military and be able to extend it beyond the military. Uh, usually it requires more education and more training, but it puts them on a great career path. If you want to be successful in life, then pursue your passion. But I learned young from mentors who I mentored with that encouraged me to always take risk, never just settle in and just kind of enjoy the job. Take risk because risk will force you to be that more innovative and will help you grow. So that's my advice is follow your passion and take some risk. Well, thank you, Jim. This has been a great discussion. Really appreciate your sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephen. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Submariners. Here are some resources for those who have lived under the water and those curious about that world. The Naval Submarine League is a group of submarine advocates and enthusiasts. Find their Northern California chapter at northerncalifornia.navalsubleague.org. If you want to learn about and visit a World War II submarine in San Francisco, the USS Pampanito is a trip back in time. Visit maritime.org slash USS Pampanito to learn more. The U.S. Submarine Veterans Mare Island Base meets the third Saturday of every month from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at Vallejo Veterans Building. The U.S. Submarine Veterans Dolphin Base meets the second Saturday of every month from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Moffett Field Museum in Mountain View. Veterans Voices is brought to you in part by contributions from the Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation, dedicated to helping veterans near you. American Legion Post 246, honoring the tradition of the American Legion in Danville. If you would like to help sponsor Veterans Voices, you can donate to Veterans Voices Care of Diablo Valley Veterans Foundation. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider's schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also rewatch this episode and many others on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa, so be sure to subscribe. Our next show will air on Monday, August 8th at 7 p.m. We will be talking with Corman. You won't want to miss it. To all of our veterans and their families, thank you for serving. To all of you who tuned in tonight, thanks for watching and have a great evening.